So welcome back after the coffee break. So now in the second part of today's um, lecture, we will now dive into the, the questions of symmetries, like what, what ro role they play and, and what we can do with them and how, how to um, deal with them in an exactization code. So um, as, a, as an example, we have written down a Hamiltonian um, um, here, that way. That's the sum over, over bonds on a lattice. So i, j are, are pairs of sites. And there's an interaction here, which we call j, x, y, which couples x and y component of, a, of here, I, we think about the spin a half problem um, in, the, in such a way. And then there's a, a coupling in the z spin direction, which is th possibly different. So that's a so-called x, x, z model. Um, and then we can ask ourselves, what are the symmetries which this problem has? So um, one thing which you can see by, by rewriting the Hamiltonian, the Sx, and the Sy part, um, is that it actually only involves spin flip operations. So it's, you can rewrite that as Jxy divided by 2 times S plus S minus Ij and S minus S plus. Um, so there, then it's obvious that it conserves to total Sc. So that's the reason why we considered such a C conservation uh, previously in the, in the first lecture. And um, so therefore, you can actually restrict yourself uh, to a given AC sector. Respectively, you can, you can treat um, all the AC sectors one after the other and, and accumulate the lowest energies uh, in each of the AC sector and figure out in what sector the ground state actually is. Um, and that symmetry is actually simple to implement because, um, for example, while constructing the complete basis, you actually check each basis state whether it has the correct AC, um, which you desire to look into, and you discard all states which do not satisfy that constraint. And then you, you register only those states in your Hilbert space having the correct AC as a basis state. <clears throat> and then typically, if you're, if you're working on a, on a regular lattice, um, like on a, on a um, for example, a torus lattice, a square lattice with periodic boundary conditions, then the, the Hamiltonian has additional symmetries. So if, if also, and one thing is the lattice, but the other is also that the, the couplings have to be um, symmetric on the lattice operations. And, and then you have um, um, a substantial symmetry group in addition, which, um, <clears throat> which can be a, a few hundred elements uh, large. So in many, in many cases, uh, but it's not exclusive, but in many cases, if you have regular lattices, um, you have a translation um, symmetry group, which is um, abelian, and then you have a point group symmetry in addition, and then and the full space group is roughly the product of the two, of the two groups. <coughs> and, um, and we will spend some time now to, to explain how, what the technology is to actually implement these, um, these symmetries. But then um, at particular um, points, you have additional symmetries. For example, if you take this XXC Hamiltonian and you, make the, um, you, you put the AC, the JZ coupling, uh, strictly the, equal to JXY, then this model not, does not only have um, um, this, XY, uh, this um, AC symmetry, but actually it acquires a full SU2 symmetry with the full um, uh, spin. Um, 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 conservation, so then where, where they have, you have the total SU2 spin S, which is also conserved. And, and so you, you would think that it's actually quite natural to, to include as many symmetries in your code a, as possible, but actually it turns out that it's not so simple to, to um, implement on the same footing the conservation of, of lattice symmetries, like of momenta and, and discrete angular momentum, uh, together with the, with the SU2 symmetry of the, um, of in spin space. So, so typically, you, um, so it's not that it's mathematically impossible. It's possible to do that. That's not not a problem. But it just turns out that the code where you implement, where you do basis reduction with both, is um, become so complicated and and inefficient that it's it's not used in production in production applications. Th that's the main challenge. But if one someone has a clever idea how to combine that, I, I think there is still room for this for this reduction. But it's not something which people do do for large-scale um, uh, computations. So you, you can do, I, I mean, I will mostly talk about um, how to implement the, the space group uh, symmetry, but you can also actually um, drop the space group symmetry and only work with total spin. That's also something which uh, people sometimes do. Um, so for SU2 spin, you don't gain um, a lot, because um, if, you, if you look, for example, at the system sizes we have, uh, like which are in the 30, the 40, or 50 spins for spin a half, 
then the, the number, if you say, for example, I want to restrict to the global singlet sector, if you look by how much the singlet sector is smaller than the overall Hilbert space, you're, you're roughly in the same order of magnitude as the gain you get by using um, um, point group symmetries. So they don't differ by a lot. Of course, if you could combine both of them, it would be uh, interesting, but that's technically challenging. But something which, um, which is in an interesting development is that um, um, in the group of Frederick Mila in Lausanne, they, they recently came up with, um, with a way to use SUN symmetry. So if you're interested in SUN symmetric spin um, Hamiltonians, there the reduction to actually work in a, in a singlet sector is much bigger. And then you can actually, um, um, by choosing not to implement lattice symmetries, but to implement SUN spin symmetry, you can actually study larger systems by using that reduction than using the path using lattice symmetries. So that there are... Um, there are applications where it's actually, um, it pays off to implement the, the full um, SUN symmetry. But for SU2, it's not, it's not that impressive. It's mostly when N gets larger that you really gain something beyond um, calculations which use not the full SUN symmetry, but only the, the diagonal um, conservations of, of, um, of flavors, but still uses um, a point group symmetry. But some additional remnant of the SU2 symmetry is that if you're at, at SC equals zero in that model, so if you have as many up as, as down spins and your, your Hamilton is of that type, you actually have um, a so-called spin flip symmetry. In particle language, it's more like a particle hole symmetry where, you'd, where each configuration is, is basically mapped onto its conjugate in terms of occupations or spins. And... Um, and that, that's a symmetry for, for any of the JC values, even if JC is, is not one. But if, if JC is actually one, so if you're looking at the Heisenberg model and you're implementing this symmetry, which is simple to implement in your computational basis, then you, you're actually able to discriminate between even and odd spins. So this, this, like, this Z2 type symmetry, it has eigenvalues plus or minus one. It actually splits your SU2 representations into even and odd sectors. And so even though you're not able to, to get full SU2, um, block reduction, you can still, using this discrete symmetry, you can still use um, kind of divide Hilbert space in half, and that, that's, that's something which is simple to implement and which is worth looking into. So here, here you get an idea about the, the symmetries which one typically encounters, and, um, and let us now have a look at how, um, how spatial symmetries uh, come come around and uh, appear. So so actually, um, spatial symmetries are important for two for two reasons. The one, which is clearly a, a computational aspect, is that they are important for the for reduction of Hilbert space. Because um, um, as it is obvious, if you have symmetries, you can block diagonalize your Hamiltonian, and after that, your, your, the, the block you still have to consider has a smaller linear dimension as the one without, where you have all blocks in, involved, and so you can reduce the computational effort for for a, a single block. So that that's one thing. But that's not the only reason why we're using symmetry. It's actually also that um, that knowing eigenstates or eigenspectra uh, with symmetry resolved uh, quantum numbers actually can uh, teach us a lot about the physics at work. For example, you can uh, learn about dispersion of excitations because you can, you can see how, excite they, how excited states above the ground states disperse as a function of, say, linear momentum or angular momentum. And you can also read off um, symmetry-breaking tendencies. And, and this, this aspect will be part of, um, of tomorrow morning's lecture where we talk about spectroscopy. And as, as an example, you can, you can actually look at the many-body energy spectrum of a, of a say, um, a Heisenberg antiferromagnet on a, on a square lattice. By just looking at the energy spectrum, you can already get quite convincing evidence that this system is, um, is likely to order magnetically in the thermodynamic limit. And you can do that by just looking at the, the structure of the low energy state, and that's something which is quite a, an interesting way to study um, ordering tendencies in, in complicated um, uh, systems. <clears throat> Um, and so to give you an idea about, about some, some lattices, um, I mean, if you come from, from um, quantum Monte Carlo or some other world, you typically use, for example, if you have a square lattice, then that a, a simulation cluster you would use, it would, uh, would typically run some units in the, in the x direction of your, of your lattice and some units in the y direction, so like a 6 by 6 cluster or an 8 by 8, which is quite natural. But actually, it, it turns out that you can look at other 
periodic tilings of your of your 2D systems, which still have the topology of the torus, but which have other number of lattice sites and just like something like Lx times Ly. Um, and this is a particular example. So this is a 40 site square lattice, and you can see that the, the red boundary is like the is the boundary of your simulation cell. <coughs> and um, and what is not, not obvious, perhaps if you see this the first time, is that, um, that you actually still have, um, have a, a lot of symmetries in, in that simulation cluster. So, um, so first of all, what are the colors of these sites? So this actually tells you that, that uh, for example, this orange site here is, um, has its periodic image here. So this is really the same site. It's identified. This is not the second one. And this is also the same as this one and as this one. So this, this site appears four times, but actually each time it only contributes a quarter. <clears throat> and then this um, cyan uh, point, that's also the same. They differ by a, a simulation cell um, periodic kind of lattice vector and, and the green one uh, as well. And if you now start to, to, um, to, col uh, to count each of these colored points only once and you add up all the sites which are clearly within the simulation cell, you see there are 40 spins, 40 lattice sites in there. <clears throat> and... Um, and, and then you, you can periodically repeat that. I think it's obvious that you can cover the entire 2D plane with such um, uh, tilted lattices, uh, which uh, it's just that the, that the translation from one simulation to the cell to the next is tilted with respect to the lattice, atti lattice axis, but that's not a problem. Something which is not so obvious, but you can actually also define really translation symmetry within the cluster by, by microscopic shift into the x or the y direction. And the cluster is really, uh, consi the, the boundary conditions are such that you can really consistently define a 40 translations within that cluster. <clears throat> and actually also, if, if you think about, you, you can convince yourself that, for example, the cluster is actually also periodic um, um, with, um, is consistent with rotations about this central site here. So you, you can make um, 90 degree rotations about this central site. And, uh, and so it, it still has a, a discrete fourfold rotation symmetry like the, the square lattice actually has. So the only symmetry which this, the infinite square lattice has, which this cluster does not have, are reflection symmetries. So like if you if re re reflect through such a, a lattice axis here, which runs either along x, uh, y here, or x, or on the diagonal, they are not compatible with the shape of the cluster because then it gets flipped and it does not lie on top of each other. So reflections are not symmetries of this cluster, but all translations are and fourfold rotation symmetries. So overall, um, this, um, the, the, the space group of this, of this 40 side square lattice has a translation group of 40 elements and the point group um, of uh, four elements, these four rotations. So together you have this cluster has 160 point group elements. And that's nice because if you're then working in a, in a one-dimensional representation of that discrete uh, um, space group, you, you can actually reduce the Hilbert space of, of your model um, after, say, a spin um, reduction, a C reduction. You can get another factor 100 of 60 with a reduction because you're using, for example, a fixed momentum zero and um, angular momentum around this lattice uh, central site. Um, you, you have four different choices of angular momentum. If you choose one, you get really a 160 um, 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 reduction, factor reduction of your, of your Hilbert space, which is quite, quite welcome. And another example here is a, is a magnetic molecule. So there, there exist magnetic molecules in nature which, where the, the magnetic ions sit on, on the, the red sides of this um, interesting looking um, structure. So this, this um, is a, a, a so-called icosi dodecahedron. So this has 30 vertices, so 30 sides. Um, and the, the point group of, of that object is the icosahedral group, which has 120 elements. So since magnetic ions of that type exist, it's, there's also some interest in studying the quantum spin models on these lattices. And, and here you're also interested in using all kinds of, of, um, of now um, uh, kind of spherical symmetries, discrete spherical symmetries. And you can also use these symmetries and, and implement uh, them. <coughs> Ah, uh, um, <coughs> no, I mean, I mean, the, the, the lattice sites have some <coughs> geometrical, I mean, you, you can generate them geometrically using some program, and then you can also think about the action of the symmetry groups, and then, then the computer can actually figure out the symmetry group for you. So you don't have to do that by hand necessarily. <coughs> <coughs> 
I mean, like, like here, here, here there's, a, there's a rotation axis through the center of this um, pentagon here. You have a five-fold rotation axis. And then you also have, have, have um, reflection symmetry planes and so on. And um, yeah, but, but typically, I mean, you, you, these are, since these are also molecules, I think you can also resort to looking to chemistry or, 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 or crystallographic literature or, or software, and then you can extract information like that for your, if you're doing um, simulation on similar molecules or so. <clears throat> so something I, I would like to, to, to show you a bit about how, how clusters are possible is that some people in my, in my group have actually started um, doing... Um, so a, a lattice catalog, so I can show you this quickly. So there's actually a systematic way to generate um, lattices for a different um, type. For example, here there are square lattices, and then um, I think they went up to, I think, 48 sites or something. Um, and then you can actually click, for example, if you're saying you're, you're interested in, in doing a spin model on some, on some lattice, and you say you could uh, afford something like 20 sites, so, for example, you can go here to square lattice 20. You click on it, and then you get a list of all the of all the these um, periodic tori of uh, of square lattices. And here, here we start with um, the, the most symmetric is typically listed first. So you see, there's a, a certain convention how to label them. Square lattice. It has a point group symmetry of C4. So, so actually, um, it also has a, a rotation. Um, as, as 20 translations, that's always obvious, but then it also has a fourfold rotation symmetry. It also tells you what are the high symmetry points in the bridge round zone. So gamma is the center of the zone. Um, M is a point, um, here is pi pi, um, the, the corner, the one corner of the zone. And then there's X, which is in like pi zero here. And then it has a few other points in the discrete bridge round zone of that, of that cluster. And then depending on the phenomena you have in mind, you can check whether the cluster you which is like this one, where it has, it has the, high, the high symmetry points which you require for your the physics which <coughs> wants to manifest. Or you can actually also try just go through different types of cluster and, for example, figure out which one has the lowest energy because that might be an indication of, of the physics going, going on. And then I can also show you, like, um, for example, if you take um, a typical square lattice which you would also choose, which is like a six by six. So 36, you see there are, there are many of them. And so the first one which pops up is, the, is just a standard six by six lattice. And here you can see the point group is slightly larger. It's D4, which means it, that's a symmetry of the square lattice, which has four, symmetry, four um, reflections in addition to four <coughs> um, um, rotations. And, and therefore, it, it has eight point group elements, has 36 translations. So here, the point group is already larger. And then you can also see the, the different k vectors you have in your, in your uh, discrete uh, Brillouin zone here. And so that, that's quite nice. And perhaps in the future, we'll, we'll make that, that uh, lattice catalog available online. And so people can then perhaps uh, uh, refer to, to, um, to this library in somehow clarifying what simulation tori they actually use for their for their ED simulations. <laughs> and yeah, in the catalog, there are also uh, um, triangular lattice and kakumi and honeycomb lattices and so on. And one can, can uh, um, include and uh, extend that probably also to, to three dimensions and so on later. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, and, and so, I mean, it's a bit related to a question you, you had. I mean, so sometimes sy symmetries are not, not always um, easy, easily visible. And then there, there are options to use graph theoretical tools to determine the symmetry group. And so here, some ca packages which came to my mind are, on the one hand, uh, Naughty. So Naughty is a, is a, a, a code suite which is actually able to, to figure out automorph automorphisms of graphs. So, so a, a lattice model, like, like a lattice here, if you... If you say you, you want to study a, a, a nearest neighbor model, you can actually write down an interaction graph where there are edges between sides which are coupled. And then you can ask what is the symmetry group, the automorphism group of a, of a graph with such edges, which have, might have even have different colors. And then Naughty is a code tool which actually is able to tell you how many symmetry operations uh, the automorphism group of that graph has, and then it can, it can it would tell you for that cluster that, that if you're looking at the nearest neighbor models where all bonds have the same color, so are therefore the same, it would tell you that indeed this cluster has 160 elements. And so, um, 
because sometimes it happens if you're looking at, at kind of small clusters, sometimes they can have additional symmetries which are artificial. Um, and then actually Naughty will tell you that this cluster has more symmetries than what you expect. And then you can think about whether you want to implement these additional symmetries or whether, whether they're just an artifact of your small cluster. So one thing which is a curiosity, for example, is that if you're studying a, a, a four by four um, lattice, so the, a four by four lattice, where, where here, here you always mean periodic boundary conditions in that direction, I mean here, and, and in that direction the same way. So how, how many th symmetries do you think this square lattice has? If you just consider it as, a, as just a, a, a four by four square lattice, how many symmetries do you think it, it has? How much? No, the, but this one is a, is a, so first of all, like how many translations does it have? It has, it has 16 translations. And since the simulation cell is, is really a four by four square, which is aligned with the lattice axis, the point group symmetry you have, uh, which you expect, is actually also fourfold. Uh, it has eight elements. Because it's really the, the point group, in addition, has, has a cardinality of eight. So together, this is 128 elements. That's, that's your guess. But if you actually run naughty on that cluster, it tells you, if I'm not mistaken, I think it tells you that these are 384 elements. The question is, what is wrong with that cluster? Pardon me? You can um, hold it to diamond structures and uh, just some additional rotation of symmetry or... Yeah, I'm not aware about the diamond, but actually I think it's like a, it's a four-dimensional hypercube. So the, the reason is basically, um, um, I mean, I think, I mean, like a... I mean, first of all, you can ask what, what is a four-dimensional hypercube. So it's basically a cube which has eight eight sides, um, and then it's basically it has another cube which which lives like um, translated into the fourth dimension. So I'm, I'm putting them next to each other, but it's actually meant to be like a, um, a step away in the fourth dimension. So, so you agree that this together gives um, gives already sixteen sides because it's two cubes. But then, then if you actually think about that they're connected in, in such a way here, then your coordination number is correct because um, um, like a, on a cube, each side has coordination number three. But if you now link them with an additional bond into the fourth dimension, they have a coordination number four. So that also seems to match. And if you start to think about it, you actually figure out that this four by four by four lattice, which you put down on a square, can equivalently, if you just consider nearest neighbor coupling, is actually the same as a four-dimensional hypercube. But if you, if you think about the symmetries of a four-dimensional hypercube, I mean, for example, you will have rotation axis um, around the, the body diagonal of a cube, and that's a three-fold rotation axis. And that is, gives you a hand-waving argument why you have a factor three more symmetries here than you would expect by this consideration of a square, of a, a, a square cluster. So, I mean, um, dangers like that are not always lurking around, but there are some innocently looking clusters like this four by four, which actually have more symmetries than, than you would naively expect. And that's just the properties of these kind of small clusters. And, and the impact of that is also interesting to know about is that um, if you have a cluster which has more symmetries, it actually also means that the, the, the representation of your larger space group or point group actually also lead to, to larger representations. Like irreducible representations are larger, have larger dimensions. And the effect is, is that, that if you, for example, study say, a spin wave spectrum of a Heisenberg model on that cluster, you, you will see that in your energy spectrum, there are points in the Brillouin zone having exactly the same energies, which are not required to be the same by, si by si the natural symmetries you have in mind, like if you would trace a dispersion. So, for example, what it turns out is that momenta, uh, pi over 2, pi over 2, and, and momentum uh, pi 0, for that particular problem, they actually have exactly the same energy, and, but that's something which, in general, you're not expecting. I mean, pi, pi, pi half, pi half, and pi zero are not symmetry related on the square lattice symmetries. They are distinct points. They, they are expected to have different energies. 
But what, what happens is that since this cluster has actually a, a larger hidden symmetry, this actually makes that these two representations are somehow merged into a larger representation of a larger symmetry group, and then they end up having the same energy. But then that's something which is a, a particularity of that cluster. And if you study the same model on larger and larger clusters, you see that, for example, these two energies actually split, and, and they have different values in the thermodynamic limit. But this is just some, some remark that, that you have to be <coughs> uh, cautious. And, and also the 4x4 class is something that people do for Hubbard models and, and other, ne other nearest neighbor models. But it's important to actually know that some of, some of the aspects of this might be, might be um, um, particular to that cluster. So it's important to know about, about this in case you're ever looking into properties of this. Yes? No, it's not there, yeah. Like if you take this 40 side cluster, for example, or even a 6 by 6, a perfectly 6 by 6 cluster, it does not have this hypercube aspect. It's really a particularity of that 4 by 4, of that particular 16 side cluster. No, no, once you believe that and you, 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 you make that embedding, you realize it's true. I mean, I mean. I mean, there are two ways. I mean, okay, I, I, it, this has been discussed in the literature before, so it was not, not my observation, but, but it's, um, that's, and, and people have, have re remarked that. But one way to go, in case you, you would not know about that, is that if you, for example, run naughty on, on a 4 by 4 cluster with nearest neighbor interaction, you will figure out that it has more symmetries than, than this um, 128 we would expect. It actually will tell you, I think, it, you have this num, or even more, I, I forgot. But at least it's more than... It, and it has an additional rotation three symmetry in addition, and, and, and this graph tool would tell you that this particular cluster has a larger symmetry group than you would expect. <clears throat> yes. I, I don't see how you can use at the same time the not the, the naive constellational symmetry and those additional constellations. How can you use both at the same time? Which which two you you mean? The, the normal translation. Yes. And this. Uh, uh, there, there are not not two. I mean, the translation group is still generated by the by the the, the naive uh, um, single step translation into x and y direction. Okay. I mean, the translations. I mean, it, these are just the. Um, like this twisted translation, that just tell you how the periodic boundary conditions are de determined. That just tells you like that, that this, this edge here is identified with, identified with that edge. But that's not the translation symmetry of your, that's not what I mean by translation. The translations are still generated by these, by these steps here. <clears throat> but what is important is that somehow you, you glue that together, that if you, like that side, if you shift it into x, it will shift to here, to here, to that one, and then by periodic boundary conditions, it will. Next time you shift, it will appear here, 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 and then uh, you will come. Then you, you go enter that, you enter here, and then you will go like that. You come here, and then you're back. So you somehow see there is a. The translations are all generated by Tx, but it will only close probably after 20 or so steps, I think. So like there's a 20. Like the order of that element is 20 in that case. And in the y direction, it, it's, this, it's the same. So, so, the, so the, the group has a particular uh, structure. So it's not like if you take a 6 by 6 lattice, like you have two cyclic group spaces. You have a loop 6 in that direction. You have a loop 6 in that direction. Here it's a bit different. It's more like 20 times 2 or something like that. But it's still an abelian group, and you know how its momenta look like. Um, and, and everything's fine from that translation point of view. Okay, are there more questions? So in the next step, we would actually like to, to reduce the basis <coughs> um, to really somehow keep less information about the Hilbert space, to really reduce the size of the Hilbert space. And um, so the first step is what, what we already discussed, is that we, we build um, a, a list, a preliminary list of all allowed states, 
which satisfy what one might call diagonal constraints, like particle number or total SE. So that's what the case we discussed before. So we filter out all states which do not satisfy these kind of simple constraints. <clears throat> and now the idea is basically, if you have translation symmetry, um, and also point group symmetries, the way we represent our Hilbert space, these symmetries really act as permutation symmetries on the level of the occupation of our uh, local states. Like in a spin chain, in a spin chain here, uh, for example, here we have a four-site spin chain with, with a cyclic uh, translation group here. And, um, and so the symmetry really um, acts, okay, this is the identity, but this is a shift by one lattice site, but it really just uh, permutes the lattice sites the occupation of lattice sites here by shifting them one cyclically to the to the right. So like the zero moves to one position to the right. Um, and that's kind of, I mean, this seems obvious perhaps in this example, but it's important to know that, that um, here we somehow working with symmetries which really uh, leave the states, the nature of the states invariant, they're just permuting them around on the, on the lattice sites. But if you have something like um, a spin orbit, um, symmetry, like if you have Rilastivitzik thing, then actually, for example, you could imagine that by, by doing a spatial rotation that you also have to rotate in spin space. But this is not taken into account here. So here we're not considering operations which are combined spin orbit operations. So if you, if you would do a spatial rotation, and then you would also have to rotate spin, that's not in here. So in, in the spin space, so like in occupation number basis, nothing is happening uh, apart from per permuting the states which are already there. So this is a it's it's still a powerful setting, but it does not encompass like a combined spin spin and spatial symmetries at the same time. <clears throat> and now the idea is basically, um, as you can see here, if you have this permutation, then basically if you have a configuration, a any configuration, if you apply symmetries onto them, you will generate the so-called orbit. You will generate a certain set of configurations which are all related to one configurations by, by one symmetry operation. And the idea is basically, instead of having all these different configurations which just differ by a symmetry operation from, from a, a, a starting one, you would actually like to delete all of the other ones and just keep one. And that's, that's the one which represents this whole orbit. And that's actually the reason why you want to, com I mean, that you can compress the Hilbert space. If you're able to, to only keep one state which represents the whole orbit, that then you have, you have basically made the compression of, of, with the factor of the size of the orbit. <clears throat> So here in that case, um, here for example, so we, we, we're back to some um, SC equals one state on this four side chain. Now we're looking at it as a periodic uh, ring. And we, we don't talk about reflections, of course, all, although this, this has reflections, but here we're just considering the translation group aspect of it. <clears throat> so we have these four elements, the identity and the, and the three shifts with one, two, and three lattice sites. Uh, and so if you take this, always the same state here, we shift it, that's identity. We shift it here, it goes to the, to the right. We shift it by two units, we shift it by, th by three. And now, and now we need to somehow define a rule by which we actually uh, choose the so-called representative. And one natural choice is that, is, as I stated here, is that <clears throat> we take a state, we apply all symmetry operations, and we keep it the state only as a representative if it's actually the smallest integer in this orbit. And so in this particular example, if you start with a state which has the leading, uh, the leading uh, bit set to zero, uh, that, that's, that's the smallest integer representation of all the ones generated here. So that state you would keep, that's the representative of that orbit. However, if, if we start, if you would take another state of that same, very same orbit, uh, here we realize that, that this one is actually not the, the lowest image we have generated, because if you shift that one three times to the right, we get, we get the same state. So this state here, we will discard, and only this one here is kept as a representative. So that's basically how, how it's really done in the code. You go through all the states, you apply all symmetries, and you keep the state if, if the one you start with is the lowest one among all you have visited when you apply the symmetries onto it. <clears throat> and so, and then what you're doing conceptually is that you, you're making basically doing a, uh, building a, a delocalized state or a block state or a symmetric superposition of your, of your state. <clears throat> um, and so th that's, that's written here a bit more mathematically here. So R is like the representative. So R is kind of a, of a, is a state in your Fox space, um, but one which is not yet symmetrized. 
<clears throat> and what you're doing here is basically you sum now over all the group elements of your symmetry group uh, uh, large G. So G is a symmetry group, small g is an element of the symmetry group. So you're summing over them, and then you apply G onto R. So it has some action, it permutes the bits. <clears throat> and so you, you generate um, several other uh, ket states. Um, and then um, by the you have some phase here, so some number. Uh, chi of G, and chi is the, is the, is the character of the, um, of the representation you're working in. So, I mean, I don't have time to actually uh, do a course on, on group theory, but if you want, like, um, uh, groups have irreducible representations, so these are like, as the name says, irreducible blocks where the symmetry acts consistently within, and these uh, irreducible representations have, um, have a number, uh, some class uh, a function, which is called the character, and the character gives you a number, um, for a certain representation. So chi is a function of the representation. And in simpler terms, if you have, a, say, a translation group, a representation is, is like a, a choice of a momentum. So different momentum sectors are different irreducible representation of translation group. And then the, the character here would just be like the Bloch factor. So like e to the i k times r, where r is like the element or, or yeah, is, has plays the role of of the shift of G and uh, and chi is then this Bloch factor. So that's like an example for a for a character of a, of an irreducible representation. And for the expert, so like the formula as it's written down here, it actually it applies only to to um, irreducible representations of dimension one. If you if you're considering um, irreducible representations of ha of um, of a larger dimension, um, th this formalism has to be changed somewhat. But I'm not talking about this because actually, in, not in all cases, but in many cases, you can actually get around the use of, of larger dimension uh, representations and actually um, reduce the size of the symmetry group. And for the smaller group, still work with one dimensional representation. And you're able to reconstruct the same information as, as working with a larger symmetry group, but with, with, um, with uh, irreducible dimensions which are larger than one dimensional. <clears throat> Okay, and so, so you see here the basic idea is basically we, we build an orbit and, we, and we, we, we sum them up with the appropriate phase fact by this character. And then at the end, we, we want to normalize the state. So, um, so there's a, a trivial normalization here, which we take a square root of, of the number of group elements. Um, and that has the effect that if, if uh, basically in the orbit, uh, we really generate um, a G different um, um, states, which are not the same, then it's clear that we have to normalize by square root g here. Um, but what can happen is that um, that some microscopic state is actually invariant under, under, um, under some of the elements of, of our symmetry group. And we will see examples of that. In that case, it actually means that here, here there will be a less number of, of, um, of a, a ket states generated, but they actually like have a double amplitude, which means that the, the probability amplitude will be squared, so there might be a correction factor here. And, and this we call calligraphic n. And the calligraphic n, you can see here, it's given basically by the sum over all elements of g, which leave g invariant. So it's like a stabilizer group or something. It's like a, the group, a subgroup of g, which actually leaves the, the, the specific microscopic configuration invariant. That this is a subgroup of g. And so we, we sum up these phase factors here. And, uh, and take the square root, and this gives this co correction factor. So you, you can see that states which have additional symmetries with respect to the symmetries at hand, uh, they, they, can, they actually are normalized differently. And that's a bit tedious, but you really have to take care of that. Otherwise, your, your calculations are wrong. So, um, and you will now see um, um, basic some examples which make it clear in what, in what um, uh, cases this can, this can happen. So again, we, now we study in, in somewhat detail just the very same four sides in a half ring with cyclic translations. Again, and now we also look at different um, um, SC sectors. So let, let us start now. So here we choose a linear momentum to zero. So that actually means we're now making a definite choice for our uh, um, representation. So basically having zero momentum is choosing the, the completely symmetric representation of our four, po four, four um, side translation group. So it, it basically means that this chi of g is just one for all g's. That, that's the zero momentum representation of the translation group, if you wish. So g, uh, chi of g is always one here. And now, um, 
we're looking at different states in our Hilbert space. We have, um, for four spins, we have AC equals two, AC equals one, and zero. And here we also have minus one and y minus two, but they are the same, so I didn't put them. Um, so if you have AC equals to two, so you see that that's the ferromagnet, all, all, all the bits are the same. And it's obvious that this state is, is completely symmetric. Whatever permutation you would apply onto it, it's symmetric. And so it's obviously an example where, where G of R always equals R. So basically the subgroup over which you're summing here is really the full group actually. So here you, you're summing up all the characters um, and therefore there's a large correction factor for the norm here because you actually here you have four different, yeah, you, you, yeah, you, the amplitude is actually four here. Um, and then um, if you do the same for SC equals one, if we get back the state we have discussed before. So the representative is zero, one, one, one. And, the, and, and since this, um, um, if you apply the, the translations, all there will be four distinct states. This correction is actually one, and so this is a standard case. And in the C equals zero case, we have two different orbits. There is this orbit with, um, with a staggered occupation with up, down, uh, sorry, down, up, down, up. It's like a nail state on four sides. And this is slightly symmetric because as you can see, if you shift that state by two lattice sides, it's already invariant. So it's, um, it gives you a, a, a different norm because the, the state itself is more symmetric than, than, uh, than the symmetry group. <clears throat> and, um, and therefore it has a different norm factor. This is, not, this is completely symmetric. This is only symmetric on, on, uh, under two-step two translation. So it has a, a correction factor, which is square root of two. And there's a, another orbit in this AC equals two, which is zero, zero, one, one. Um, that has four different images, so N is one. So that's one thing. So uh, on the one hand, you have to worry about the, the norm correction factor. But now we go to finite momentum, for example, uh, plus minus pi over two. And now you can see that, that um, the norm can not only be modified, it, a state can actually also be um, absent from a, from a sector. So here, for example, the ferromagnet um, I mean, somehow it's clear, oh, the ferromagnet is a single state, and now we have projected it into the, <coughs> the zero momentum representation, so it has, that state already has a fixed momentum by itself, so we cannot expect that state to have another momentum as well, it's only one state, it cannot appear in different irreducible representations. And what happens here is basically, is that if you calculate this n here, if you sum over all the characters, which are basically um, um, one i minus one and minus i, for the, for the four shifts, if you sum them up, these are four roots of unity, they add up to zero. So n, like for this state, because it's the full group, and chi um, for momentum pi over two are these, these four characters I mentioned, this n actually sums up to, to zero, and so you have to delete that state, which means the ferromagnet is equals two, there's no state at pi over two in that, in that sector. Um, then this s equals one, that state is present, that's fine. But among the two orbits in S equals zero, this one is actually de deleted. It's not there as well. Um, but the other orbit here, it's, it's present. So we see that at, that at this momentum, our Hilbert space is, is, um, it looks slightly different than at zero momentum because here we have now, say, four orbits in that list. But here, two out of the four orbits have been deleted. They are not there for that momentum. And then we're lacking the, the last momentum, which is momentum pi. Momentum pi, it's yet different, so the ferromagnet again does not appear. Um, the S equals one, it again it appears, but the two orbits at the S equals zero, they're both present. Um, so you see the zero, one, zero, one is still present, and that one as well. And so now we have basically decomposed our, our Hilbert space of a, of a four side chain into these different momentum sectors, and we have learned that, that the, the projection into symmetry sectors actually also can lead to, the, to cancellations that the state um, a certain orbit is only present in, a, in a, a subset of the irreducible representations and not all of them. And we have to keep, really keep track for each orbit. We have to keep track whether it's actually canceled or whether it has a modified norm. We need to know that information for all of, your, of our representatives. Otherwise, the calculations are not correct. Um, and now to make the thing, we have to now to check whether the, the, the decomposed Hilbert space really has the correct dimension. So... So we have four spins. Um, so the overall Hilbert space needs to have 16, um, uh, I mentioned 16. So here, here we have AC equals plus two and minus two. This gives, so we only have one state here at zero momentum and you have another one for minus, AC equals minus two, that gives one plus one. <clears throat> so in the AC equals one, we have seen the, here that orbit really decomposes into four states, uh, four different momenta like this. There are two momenta here and that one. 
is 4, and there's another one for minus, SC equals minus 1, which is 4 plus 4. <clears throat> then we see that this state here, it only appears twice, namely once in this momentum and one in this sector, it receives 2, and this one appears 4 times 4, and if you sum that up, you can convince yourself that this is 16, so we, are, we have kind of correctly redistributed the states into, into the grid of SC and momentum uh, sectors. <coughs> Yeah. So, so basically, what? Yeah. So you really need to to know basically what this n is for each orbit. You need to know this n, and we'll now see that this this quantity enters again if we if we are now thinking about um, the structure of the Hamiltonian matrix. So, so um, if you think about what you have done, we have created the, the list the Hilbert space now with the with the representatives of their orbits and their respective norms. And now the question is basically, have we really um, um, kind of uh, saved something? I mean, we have definitely saved space because you have compressed the Hilbert space size by the, the size of, I mean, by the, the length of these orbits, which is typically, and, uh, I mean, a, a question of typicality. So if you look at this, um, this picture here, you, you see there are a lot of, hmm, sorry. So you see in this 4-4 side ring, if you look per momentum sector, you see here there are no cancellations, but here like half of the Hilbert space is, is kind of gone, and here there's a little bit. But it actually turns out if you make your system larger and larger, and these states, which, which have either spatial norms or complete cancellations, they actually get rarer and rarer. So if um, um, they are still important, so you, have to, you have to keep track of them, but they, they will be more the exception. Most of the states in Hilbert space are kind of look almost random, so they don't have, re have remnant symmetries. So the, the generic case is really that, that this norm factor is one, and it's only these exceptional states which have additional symmetries under the symmetry group which, which make, you a, make a difference, but they are, they are really in the, in the minority. So if you want to estimate the size of your Hilbert space per sector, it's, it's really basically the, the, the size of the Hilbert space um, before applying spatial symmetries, and then you can roughly divide by the size of the symmetry group, and then you get quite a good estimate of how big your, your Hilbert space is in that sector. Okay, and so, um, so with this tilde, with this R tilde, we basically mean, uh, mean that block state we have just introduced uh, one or two slides before. And the question is now, are, are we able to efficiently calculate uh, the matrix elements? Like, what is the value of, a, of an orbit, here a block orbit R tilde, with another one S tilde? Are we able to calculate the, the value of that matrix element efficiently? And so, for, for our setting, we, we look now at an elementary, so-called non-branching term in the Hamiltonian. So we have some H h alpha, which is, and so a non-branching term basically means is that if we apply such a piece of the Hamiltonian onto a, a configuration in our Fox state, we just expect to have like one new state coming out. And, um, and in case there are more states coming out, we just chunk them up into different pieces which all, are all non-branching. So a non-branching term is like, either like a diagonal Ising term or, or a spin flip term, which flips in one to another direction, they, they only give one one definite result and not a linear combination. So this is not a, re this is not a real restriction, it's just that we, we chunk our Hamiltonian into pieces which are of that kind, that, and that's possible. So we have such a piece here, um, and so that's an operator here, we apply it onto, onto the, the bit pattern R, and then we get uh, a number, so this H alpha of R is a number, and then we get um, S out. And so here you can see currently th there is no, no tilde, so that these are really just just normal Fox, Fox state uh, configurations here, uh, and that's an amplitude, that's a number. And basically, the, um, and now th there's a formula here, so we can now calculate these matrix elements am among the, the representatives, basically, without double expanding the block states. I mean, you can prove it, but then you can actually, um, you can actually simplify it, and then the final formula actually looks like this, so that the, the matrix element between two representatives um, of, of such a non-branching um, uh, term in the Hamiltonian is, is actually given by the amplitude, which is this basic amplitude here. That's the number which comes from the Hamiltonian. And then there's a, a ratio of the two normalization factors which we, which we introduce for the two um, N, uh, R, and S. So that's a property of the states. 
<clears throat> and then there is um, there's one uh, crucial aspect here is that there's a, a chi, so again, the character of the representation uh, of an element which we call G star. And G star is basically the element which, um, perhaps I have to tell you what, what happens here, is um, if, you, if you have your Hilbert space and you, you have listed all your representatives, so the representative is always like the smallest bit pattern in your, in your orbit. And if you apply an element of your Hamiltonian, you always start with that representative and you apply on it. But then when you do the, um, the spin flip on, on that representation, representative, you get a new bit pattern. That bit pattern belongs to another orbit, possibly, but, um, but it's not clear whether the, the bit pattern you have in front of you, whether that one is actually the representative in that other orbit. You can very well end up with a bit pattern which is part of another orbit, but which is not the representative because there's no, there's no insight that if you flip it somewhere, that it should really be the, the, the smallest integer in your, in your orbit of the, other, of the other orbit. And so what this element G star actually means is that there's an element or there are many elements, but they have the same character. There are elements um, in, uh, in the group G, which actually bring back this, um, this non-representative S uh, back onto its representative, so which somehow shifts it back into the orbit. And this element G star um, uh, does, does that. And so we need to know which element brings back the, um, the element to the, um, to the representative, and we need to have this associated um, um, character um, for it. And if you have that, then you now know the, the full matrix element, which you have to put into your symmetrized um, Hamiltonian. And then that's, that's basically, uh, then you have basically solved the, the problem. <clears throat> However, so I mean, at least on the formula, we are, we are fine. But now in your actual ED code, so if you have if you have this possibly non-representative S, which we have obtained by just flipping some bits, for example, so the question is basically how do we actually find this associated representative representative S tilde, um, and how do we actually get this um, G star which which brings S onto S tilde? So that if there are different strategies which are more or less clever or feasible. So the simplest thing is just to do a brute force loop over all symmetry operations, apply them onto S, and just check. Um, when we have the minimal one, that's S prime, and then we also know what is the symmetry element which brings indeed S onto S uh, tilde. Mm -hmm. um, so this does not require basically any memory because you're just doing it, but of, of course it's not very efficient because for each of these operations, you basically have to, to do that as many times as you have symmetries, and you have seen like an order of magnitude for symmetry operations is like hundreds, 100, 200, that's easily p possible if you're working on a, on a decently large 2D lattice. <clears throat> So that's something you, you perhaps you would like to avoid, like to applying um, all the symmetries again and again and again uh, in order to figure out this um, this element. <clears throat> so something you can do, which requires some memory but it's quite fast, is to prepare another lookup list relating each allowed configuration. So allowed means on the level of, of conserved SC configuration with the index of its representative and also with the associated group, ele group element or the phase factor linking the two. <clears throat> that is quite fast, but the price you pay is that you need a list of the size of the non-spatially symmetrized Hilbert space. So, so which means basically that you need um, a, a table which is as large as the Hilbert space with SC conservation taken into account, but, but not, not reduced by the number of spatial symmetries. So they can be pretty large, but, but it's still something you can afford often. And, um, and so I, I typically use them. Um, as um, these for intermediate size calculations. But now for, for specific lattices and, um, and also particular models like Hubbard models, you can also um, um, use tricks which factorize the symmetry group, the spatial symmetry group, for example, into sublattice conserving subgroups types a sublattice exchange, and then you, the, I don't describe explicitly how that is done, but I just tell you that there are such techniques where, where you can actually figure out this S tilde quite fast. Um, so you, you find that, and then you can use a hash or a binary search in the, in the list of all um, um, representative in order to get its index. Um, so that doesn't need a lot of memory, and it's somehow balanced between, I mean, this is very fast, but uses quite a lot of memory, 
this uses no memory but uses a lot of computing time and this is somehow in between you need some memory for some lookup table of sub lattices but there are still quite economic H however you pay some price in in looking up um, um, a representative list and so on to get its index and then once you actually are able to to efficiently calculate matrix elements you can then think about uh, the storage um, as we have discussed already, you, you can store the Hamiltonian in, in sparse matrix format. Um, and this gives very fast matrix vector multiplies, but is obviously limited by available memory. And, and, and the more matrix elements you had, the, the, the larger your, your matrix gets. So that can be a limiting factor. <clears throat> um, you can also store the Hamiltonian matrix elements on disk in a sparse, sparse matrix format. But I'm not sure people do that uh, these days, but, but in the past, when, where, when somehow the I.O. speed was, was still comparatively fast compared with the CPU speed, th then that was still fine. But I think in the meantime, the computing speed of the processors has, is, is much faster in comparison to the, to the read speed you can get from disk. So it's not clear whether that's still something which is actually efficiently do doable. <clears throat> And what I advocate, at least for the, for the cutting edge calculations, is to, to recalculate the Hamiltonian matrix elements in each iterations on the fly. <clears throat> um, and uh, yeah, where basically we want to devote uh, the whole memory to, um, to the Lanzos vectors. And <clears throat> there are also strategies how you can parallelize that, either using shared memory architectures or, or even using distributed memory architectures. But that, that part is a bit more, more involved. But it, it can be done. And, and, it, and giving decent hardware, it actually squares, scales quite well. <coughs> OK, yes? Pardon me, if you? I mean, basically, the, the Lanzos algorithm, at some point, it will call kind of the physics backend and ask, look, I have, a, I have a vector in your Hilbert space, apply H onto the vector. And then I'm just recalculating the matrix elements. And, uh, and uh, given a vector, I, I, I calculate the matrix elements. And I figure out, OK, that's my input matrix um, in the vector. I put the matrix element, and I store it in the result vector. And, and you don't actually have to store the matrix but you can really do this operation on the fly by only using local, local information and with, without storing the full matrix. And that, that's really where, where it's interesting that the, the Lanzos algorithm, um, as I mentioned before, it's not interested in addressing individual matrix elements of your matrix and, and doing something with it. But it, it, it just asks to deliver a matrix vector multiplication onto a vector, which the Lanzos algorithm provides. But it's not interested in actually doing operations with the matrix elements. That's different, say, from a Jacobi diagonalization, where you really you go ahead, or a householder, where you go ahead, you have your matrix, and you do operations on the matrix. That's not how, the, how a Lanzos algorithm works. It works differently. And I will explain, I will just now come to that. Are there more questions at this, at this stage? It's actually curious. Um, you have seen uh, we already spent quite some time explaining issues about symmetries and lookup tables and so on, and they are kind of m more involved, <coughs> at least or they are equally involved as as the linear algebra backhead which we come. And, and although some, sometimes people call the technique we're discussing uh, uh, using a Lanzos algorithm, actually this linear algebra part, the Lanzos algorithm, is just w one of many aspects of. Uh, of a really uh, workhorse exact diagonalization method. It's not just this, it's important, but it's not, it's not the only thing which requires investment. So if you really want to do a, have a flexible tool, you have to think about these symmetries and other aspects. And the, and the linear algebra backend, in order to get the eigenvalues, is just one aspect of it, but not, not the only one. So if you're, if you're kind of new to this business, there is a nice book, which is actually also available um, on, online which is called Templates for the Solution of Algebraic Eigenvalue Problems. And this, they describe many different um, iterative um, algorithms for, um, for eigen, eigenvalue problems. Yes? Uh, quick question. Actually, in diagonalizing the complex, do you actually write a code or do you just use the algorithm library as a language method? Yeah, yeah, it, it depends, again, what you exactly, in which regime of system sizes or Hilbert space sizes you're operating. I think if you're just working on a workstation and using RPAC or something like that is perfectly fine. 
and also it, it has some built-in facility also to converge like uh, several eigenvalues with decent precision and so on. But the problem is a bit, it, it, it can at times require like larger numbers of Lanchos vectors, which might be more difficult to control. So if you're really like doing like 48 sites on a, on a supercomputer, you really want to have strict control over how many Lanchos vectors, because they're so expensive, you really want to be sure that there's only two and not f five of them allocated, because five would kill you, two is affordable. So you really want to have fine control on that. And then for these applications, we use our own Lanzos algorithm. But I mean, at the end, it's quite simple. I mean, as we can see, there are just a few, a few basic linear algebra operations, and it's 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 reasonably simple to write a simple Lanzos solver yourself. But it's perfectly fine to use RPAC on a, like, if you have like, or if you have a Python or something to use or use this Fortran or C version of RPAC. Yeah, so uh, coming back to this book, yeah, so there are many different algorithms described, and it's also um, uh, the simple Lanzos algorithm is described in, in there, and um, so I will briefly explain to what what that does. Yeah, so here, that's the, the algorithm basically in, in a nutshell. And I will briefly explain also on the blackboard how how it works in order to get an idea. So as I said, there are other algorithms like a, a Jacobi or or, or, um, <clears throat> or, um, or householder transformation, which, which really operate on the matrix uh, typically. And, and the Lanzos algorithm is not doing that. Um, the the Lanzos algorithm is actually part of a, of a family of algorithms which are, which are called uh, Krilov algorithms. And we will see later in, in other examples which are genuine uh, Krilov algorithm, why this is, in, uh, this is important. But somehow, a Krilov algorithm, or a, a Krilov space, mm -hmm. is, a, is, a, is an object which, um, which has two ingredients, basically. So there's like a starting vector, which we call phi naught. So that's a, a vector in the Hilbert space. Here, now, for this, it, 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 it's typically a random vector. So it's one vector in the Hilbert space or in that subspace in which we're working. <coughs> There's a, an operator. Here, here it's our Hamiltonian H. <coughs> and then the Krilov space, we might write that as calligraphic um, uh, K with, a, with an index N. Um, and then it has a, a Hamiltonian, an operator, and also has a, has a starting vector phi naught. And so the Krilov space is basically the, the span the span of, um, of basically phi naught, like your starting vector, and then h times um, phi naught, and then h2 phi naught, and, and so on, up, up to some power like h to the n applied on phi naught. So, so you can see the, the, the Krilov space, it needs a seed vector, a vector where you start. It's a vector in your Hilbert space. It needs an operator. The operator in our case is H, our Hamiltonian. And then it has a number, which means basically how many powers of H do you apply onto your starting vector. And this, this space, with, so the span of these powers of H onto, onto the starting vector, that generates a linear space, a vector space. And that's a, a, a called the Krilov space. So is, is that, it's, I think it's simple and it's clear. So that, that's the Krilov space. And now, what the, in, in, curiously, what the Lanzos algorithm actually does it's just, it's, it, takes, it takes a starting vector, and the Lanzos algorithm basically uh, just builds an, um, a three diagonal, uh, builds an orthonormal basis in that Krilov space. And in that orthonormal basis, the Hamiltonian, so this operator in that three diagonal, uh, in that basis, which the Lanzos algorithm does, becomes three diagonal. So, so I can write that like the, the Lanzos algorithm. Builds an orthonormal basis of um, of this k n h of psi naught, in which um, h is three diagonal, which which means the Hamiltonian in the in the written in the basis of of um, in this particular basis, which Lanzos algorithm generates, as a form like alpha, alpha zero, alpha one, and so on, up to alpha n minus one or something, um, and either there are beta one, 
to beta n minus 1. And, and here it's symmetric, so it is also beta 1 to beta n minus 1. And the rest out there is all 0. So that's the first step. That's just to somehow put that into perspective. So what the Lanzos algorithm in the first place does, or the, the Lanzos sequence, is actually generate you um, um, vectors, which, I mean, it starts with phi naught. That's like the first Lanzos vector, actually. And then in, um, it actually basically it, it calculates h times psi naught. But that vector is not by itself orthogonal. It, it can have an overlap with phi naught. So in the first step, you're generating um, this vector, and then you're orthogonizing it to, to phi naught, and then, and then you normalize it. So there's a second vector, which, which um, it is generated by that, but then it's orthonormalized to the first vector. And then you're, you're doing another iteration, another um, uh, application onto, onto that orthonormalized, and then you, you back orthogonalize it to the previous two, and so on. And it turns out that this particular choice, which Lanzo's algorithm makes, um, builds this orthonormal basis, and the Hamiltonian H uh, ends up being three diagonal in that particular basis which the algorithm builds. So, so, so far, there is no reason yet why, why we're talking actually about the properties of eigenvalues or so on, but, but um, formally that's what the Lanzo's algorithm does. And, it, and this is an important part because this will reappear later <clears throat> in other applications, like in, for example in time evolution and in calculation of spectral functions, um, and it's important to understand what the Lanzos algorithm does in that particular context. So it, it's first of all, it's a way to to um, to tr three diagonalize a Hamil an, an operator um, in in a particular Krylov space, starting with some particular starting vector. So so that's one thing, and um, and here you can basically see in more detail what it's doing. So um, so if you add, add some intermediate steps, so th there are these Lanzos vectors uh, phi n minus 1, so phi naught is our starting vector, and so on. Um, and so, um, so we have a phi n, and then uh, what our Lanzos algorithm asks us is to apply h onto phi n. So we, we, we're doing that, our backend does that, our kind of Hilbert space implementation and so on. So we're doing that, so we get that vector, and then we have to subtract uh, beta n, which has been calculated at the previous step, minus the previous uh, Lanzos vector here. <coughs> So that's a, a phi a prime. And then we calculate um, alpha n, which is the overlap of uh, phi n with this phi n uh, prime. That, that's alpha. This gives you the new alpha. Um, and then we subtract um, from this phi prime, which you have obtained here, we have subtract minus alpha times um, alpha n. So we're kind of orthonormalizing it back to, to um, with respect to, to phi n, and then we normalize this phi double prime. So we normalize it, and the new beta value which we get is basically the, the square root of the, the norm of this, of this leftover phi, phi double prime. <clears throat> so that's the norm, and then we normalize it, and that, this gives you the new Lanzos vector. And just that's the basic sequence. So basically, you, you, reply, you have your current Lanzos vectors, you know the previous one, so you're applying h onto your current Lanzos vector, you're subtracting beta times the old one, you're calculating overlap, um, you're, ortho you're orthogonalizing it, you're normalizing it, and then you're done, then you have your new Lanzos vector, and then you do that again. And in this, in this particular way to proceed, you can show that your Hamiltonian projected into, your, into this uh, current grid of space has this three diagonal form. So that's one step, and now we're coming to the question of why are we actually using that to do um, eigenvalue computation what is now an interesting um, um, property, which is not which is not so simple to actually prove. I mean, this this part is simple to prove, <clears throat> but what is what is a curious property is that if you start with a with a random starting vector phi naught and you do that, so what you can now do is that after each iteration, so after after some finite n, you actually evaluate the spectrum of that small matrix. So you have to to keep dimensions in mind. Like in a, in a cutting edge application, the, the, these phi vectors, they really live in a huge Hilbert space, like 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 11. So they are really huge. But, um, but these, these, um, these dimensions of these Krylov spaces in typical applications are of the order of hundreds, uh, just to give you an idea. But what you can basically do is that after, each iter after one iteration, after two, after three or so iterations, we can, we can always plot the spectrum of that small uh, matrix. It's called T matrix sometimes of this um, three diagonal matrix. So it has a spectrum and the number of eigenvalues increases after each iteration. And what it turns out now is that the spectrum of this small three diagonal matrix 
um, converges at the boundaries of the spectrum extremely rapidly to the spectrum of your full operator H, which lives in the huge Hilbert space. And, and this is illustrated here. So here th there are iterations, and which means that after each iteration, we diagonalize this T matrix, and we plot the spectrum on that axis. And so this is, I guess this is a, a typical eigenvalue problem with a dimension of, say, millions or so. It's not, yeah, but it's still large compared to this. And what, what the, bottom, the bottom line is that in the, in the Lanchos algorithm, it turns out that um, the spectrum of this three diagonal matrix converges extremely rapidly to the ground state of the full problem. And so here this eigenvalue, it converts it, so this is a linear scale, but actually the convergence after some time becomes really exponential, and then you, you're exponentially close to the, to the physical eigenvalues of your huge matrix. And that's really the, the kind of the, the stunning feature of the Lanchos algorithm, is that it, it allows you to calculate extreme eigenvalues of your full um, matrix H. I mean full, I mean the, the problem in the full uh, Hilbert space, <coughs> um, with, with a number of iterations, which does not grow tremendously if you make your, your matrix larger. So even for this, say, 48-side Kagome, you actually get a, a convergence in the Hilbert space, with, Hilbert space, which is of like 10 to the 11, with a number of iterations, which is like two, three hundreds. And that's really the amazing property, which, which, is, um, which makes the Lanzos algorithm so interesting, is that you, you only need like of order two, three hundred Lanzos iterations in order to get to converge like the first one or perhaps two or three um, eigenvalues of a huge matrix. And, and that, that's the really kind of um, interesting aspect of the Lanzos, al Lanzos um, um, algorithm. <clears throat> okay, are there questions so far? Yes? What if I have a good guess for a wave function, like a DMRG wave function? Yeah, that's a good suggestion, but actually I think it turns out that it's not really so, so useful because the Lanzos converges so quickly that even if you have, a, you see, even if you have a good energy, for example, like here, um, you, you still need like, say here, you need 150 iterations overall, but if you have a good guess, you just perhaps gain like 10, 15 iterations. So, so you really have to like have an excellent guess if you really want to save something. Otherwise, on this exponential scale, there's still a lot to be done, and you, you gain only very little. <clears throat> but but, but the, the point you, ra you raise is important. I mean, if your initial state is actually does not have overlap with your, with your ground state, then it might actually take longer to converge. Because f formally, like if you're initially orthogonal, you will never have overlap with the ground state. But due to finite precision arithmetics, there are actually round-off errors, which after some time actually make you still converge to the ground state, but then it might take substantially longer. So indeed, you have to be sure that your, your initial random vector you draw is, is really random enough that it has even some tiny overlap with the ground state, but some generic small overlap and not strictly zero because it's really by symmetry or something orthogonal to your initial state. Yes, yeah, that's a good question. So, so what you do is that, um, um, so, so what, what you do is that you, you, you diagonalize this uh, three diagonal matrix and you get the eigenvalues and the eigenvalues are directly the eigenvalues of this. But the eigenvectors of, of, of this matrix are only eigenvectors which have a dimension like n or yeah, dimension n. So what they basically tell you, they give you the linear combination um, of your Lanzos vectors. And you, you have to sum up the Lanzos vector with this linear combination, and then you get the actual eigenvector in your big Hilbert space. So there are two ways to do it. Like if you want to save memory, what one typically does is that um, you do a Lanzos run until you converge. And then you know, the, you know the converged eigenvalue, but you also know the converged linear combination of your Lanzos vector. And then what you do is that you come back you start again with the same initial vector, for example, because you're using um, deterministic random numbers, which means you can regenerate your random vector because you know your seed. You can regenerate your starting vector. And now you know the linear combination, so now you're doing a second Lanzos run. You, you re regenerate exactly the same Lanzos vectors, but now you sum them up with the, with the linear combination you know. And then in the end, you have the eigenvector in your big Hilbert space. Do you understand? 
yeah, and then we know the linear combination, so we sum up the Lanchos vector, and then we get the eigenvector as the sum over the vector, the sum over the eigenvector, uh, over the Lanchos vector with the, with the linear combination uh, corresponding to the eigenvalue of that T matrix. Yeah, yeah, because something, I didn't mention it, but, but something which you can convince yourself is that, I mean, you can see it from that algorithm here, is that at each step n, you only need access to the, to like the, 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 the last, I mean, the present, the last Lanchos vector, and you're generating the new one. So like uh, simultaneously in memory, you only need two or three Lanchos vectors. So which means you can disregard the old ones. You don't need them. If you're progressing, you don't need the old Lanchos vectors anymore. You just need two or three locally, like locally in N. Um, so you can disregard the rest. But indeed, if you want to have immediate access to the eigenvector, if you, if you have converged the eigenvalues, you have to sum them up. But then it's again a question of memory. If you're doing medium-sized calculations, you can afford storing the Lanchos vector. Then you can build that linear combination immediately. Once the linear combination is known, you can sum up the, the Lanchos vector with the appropriate linear combination. But if you're having memory problems, then you have to somehow know the linear combination and start again and re re regenerate all Lanchos vectors and then sum, sum up the eigenvector while you're redoing the, the iterations. Yeah, it has to be the same. If it's not the same, uh, things get wrong. Okay. Yeah. But my remark regarding ra random numbers, so typically the initial vector is, is, a, is a random vector, but it's not completely random, but it's using some computer, I mean some pseudo, pseudo random numbers, which means if you put the same seed to your random number generator, it will exactly generate the same random sequence uh, again. So if, if, you, if you initialize your random number generator in the first run with some seed, it will be it will be pseudo random, and then you will do your lunches. But then you can just re reset the seed of your random number generator after the after your first lunches convergence, and then it will regenerate exactly the same pseudo random uh, starting vector. So you you don't have to store it, but you can regenerate it by by giving the correct seed to your random number generator. So in the second stage, we only need to do in the combination of the eigenvectors. Yeah. But we have to do it because because how you get from one from one lunch vector to the next is is by applying age. We we still have to do that. But we gain a, a little bit. We don't have to diagonalize this again. No, we, we're not interested in that. We we're, we already know what the team matrix look like. But we we don't know. In the first round, we have not known the final linear combination, so we were not able to to accumulate the eigenvector on the fly because we didn't know the linear combination we end up with. Yeah, yeah, of, of course. But but the but the thing is that you you can either pay memory by storing the Lanchos vectors and you save on time, but you you you, you waste on memory. So it's really a trade-off, and and depending on the machine and the problem size, you can you can decide to store the matrix the, the Lanchos vectors if you can. That's obviously a good choice. Then you you get your solution fast. But if you cannot store it, there's still a way there's still a way to to do the calculation by by simply redoing it again. <laughs> okay. Yes? No, no, that's some smaller. I don't know what it was. Yeah. <clears throat> but this is just a, an extract from this book, but I, I don't go through it now again. <clears throat> So, um, okay, so at first sight, everything looks perfect, but once you're interested in, um, in calculating excited states, uh, things get a bit more complicated with, with the Lanzos algorithm. And, and the, the one um, reason is, is that um, the Lanzos algorithm is very well defined for infinite precision arithmetics, and you can really formally prove that all these vectors which you generate are, are truly orthogonal, and even the one at iteration 1000 is exactly orthogonal to the first, to the first one you started with. But if you're using finite precision arithmetics, like the 64-bit double precision numbers, they have finite precision. And this, this somehow leads to uh, sometimes to subtle problems. Um, but 
but not, I mean, they, they are not as severe as one might sometimes uh, think. So what, hap what happens is that once the ground state of your T matrix <coughs> has converged, then the vectors in this re Lanzos recursion uh, tend to lose their orthogonality. And then as a consequence, fake new eigenvalues show up in the approximate spectrum. And so there are techniques by which you can remove them, but it's a bit more tedious. And th that's basically where you're probably better off using some uh, well-tested library, which has this um, deletion of ghost eigen or spurious, this spurious eigenvalues or ghost eigenvalues uh, that then uh, reinventing this yourself, because it might be that if your procedure is not working well, if you get wrong physical eigenvalues out, it's perhaps not very helpful. But this is just like putting an example to the extreme. So here I start with a here I start with the starting state, which is strictly orthogonal to the ground state. So um, I start, I run down, I converge to something, which is a higher excited state, which is an excited state. But after some time, due to this round off error, actually the state really collapses onto a physical eigenvalue. Uh, but when, what then happens is every now and then, there are new eigenvalues like uh, coming down. And then they tend to accumulate onto existing eigenvalues. And so by eye, you can actually see here what are the physical eigenvalues and which ones are not physical. Do you know which are which? But actually, like these really, these blue straight lines, these are the physical eigenvalues. They are really the ones which, um, which are the, correspond to true eigenvalues of your, of your underlying operator of the Hamiltonian. <clears throat> but if you stop at, at some moment, for example here, close to 2,500, and you stop at the wrong moment, there's an eigenvalue here, which, which has this almost vertical slope here. And if you stop at it without looking what happens as a function of lunch or situation, you might mistakenly take one of these eigenvalues as a physical eigenvalues, and then that, that's wrong. But you can see that if you're actually looking for, for eigenvalues, for example, here, which have accumulated fake degeneracies, then these are probably the, the correct ones. And so these are part of these heuristics which you, which you can do. <clears throat> but the first message actually is that if you're only interested in the ground state, then there is no ghost problem. Like the ground state is always, is always physical. There's no problem that eigenvalues somehow roll, violate variational principle or something. It's always that the, the lowest state is always fine and, and converges really to the ground state. And, and before conversion to the ground state, there are no ghost problems. They only appear once the ground state in your sector is converged and you go further on because you want to converge higher excited states. And then it might be that, that this ghost problem sets in. So if you're just converging for the ground state, you actually don't need this ghost emulation because nothing can go, go wrong from that point of view. And another conceptual important thing is to know is that this, um, this Lanzos algorithm is basically just propagating one vector through the Hilbert space. Like you start with a, st with a, with a one starting state and you propagate that one. And basically from, from, from the construction it does, it's actually not able to, to resolve uh, multiply degenerate eigenvalues. It will basically, this Krilov technique will basically only uh, pr um, get one component into each degenerate subspace, irrespective of the dim dimension of the degenerate subspace. Which means that, that formally, you can only get um, a, a list of eigenvalues, but you don't actually get the, their physical, their true degeneracies uh, correctly. If you want to do that, you actually have to resort to so-called bound Lanzos technique. So that's a, a generalization where you're not only starting with one vector, but with several vectors, which you then propagate as a bunch of vectors together. And then this algorithm is able to explore um, multidimensional degenerate subspaces. And so if you propagate five vectors, you're actually able to resolve degeneracies between, say, C, um, one and five, say. You, you can see that um, how, how degenerate eigenvalues are. But with a simple Lanzos algorithm, which just propagates one vector, that's not, not possible. <clears throat> but there are other methods like this Jacobi Davidson technique, which, which are often used in the context of DMRG. Uh, they are able to resolve uh, multiply degenerate eigenvalues. And here it's also best if you're actually interested in, in calculating um, degeneracies of excited states and also m larger number of excited states. It's probably important that you, you use um, a, an implemented and well tested library in, instead of doing it on your own. I mean, you can do it, but you have to be careful not, not making um, mistakes by doing it. Okay. Um, Yeah, and then um, we have full diagonalization. 
I mean, this land source is really about calculating the, the low-lying part or also the upper end of the spectrum. It converges on both sides, but typically we're interested in the low energy properties, so for, for ground state properties. Uh, but if you're interested in, say, um, thermodynamics of quantum many-body system or in, in the, also in many-body localization where, where really eigenstates in the middle of the spectrum are important, then you would probably go for methods which, which do a full diagonalization. Um, <clears throat> And then you can use LAPAC, Householder, um, ScalaPAC, or whatever method to diagonalize the spectrum. Um, and then to, to have an idea, so if on a, on a workstation, or I mean, nowadays even a laptop, you can do a few thousand without too much problem. On a workstation, a few ten thousand. And if you want to do Hilbert space dimensions of a few hundred thousand, you already need a supercomputer to do that. Um, so that, that gives you, so you, you can clearly see that, that for full matrix problems, uh, the, 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 the Hilbert space dimensions you're able to treat completely are really basically a, a square root of what you're able to do using these Lanchos um, and, and just of individual eigenvalues at the boundary of, this, of the spectrum. So there's, there's, there's quite a drastic difference of what you can do. Um, and also, honestly, like if you're only doing kind of this type of, of computations, then, then I think a lot of the considerations about, about like su super efficient matrix vector multiplications are not so important because in these applications, like putting, up, setting up the matrix with the matrix elements is something you, which is, uh, uh, uses negligible amount of time com com uh, compared to the actual full diagonalization of the matrix once, once it is filled. So if you're just interested in this kind of application, as, as long as your matrix calculation is correct, uh, the time is not that important. Because these full diagonalization methods scale as the third power of the Hilbert space dimension. So you can see that the third power of 100,000 really gives you a huge number. So it's clear that, the, that whereas the time to actually fill a sparse matrix is negligible compared to the time it takes the eigensolver to calculate the full spectrum of a, of a, of a dense matrix. So, so it's clear that the, the, the goals and the challenges are, are really not the same if you're doing full diagonalization compared to these large scale Lanchos kind of own, only low lying eigenvalue calculation. So these, there are clearly different, different scopes. So it is 12 o'clock now, should I stop now and continue tomorrow? No, I think it's just start with a new chapter. No, I think I will stop here. Then we see. Okay, do you have questions? Yeah, I don't have an intuitive argument why you, you get the ground state so well. I think it's, a, I mean, there's mathematical theory behind it. I think like, I mean, I think historically it was that, that Lanchos, in the Lanchos algorithm, he was really initially interested in, in, three, in a method to three diagonalize an operator or a matrix. So the Lanchos algorithm was about that. And only later people figured out that it's actually quite useful numerically. Um, and then actually, I think in the 60s or so, people, mathematicians started to prove this, this very rapid convergence property. So, so it can be mathematically proven, but I, I don't have an intuit, intuit, uh, intuitive argument to give you why we should expect this to happen. I think it's a bit of a surprise. Or I don't know whether uh, someone else has another intuition, but at least I'm, I'm not having a, a nice intuition to tell. Yeah, I'm not aware that algorithms exist which do that, but I, I might not be not informed. But as far as I know, I think there's no... Because the problem is also like, if you're interested, it might be that you can cheat around that if you're only interested in eigenvalues, but once you're interested in eigenfunctions, you really need, I mean, the dense, like the set of eigenvectors is that it gives you a dense matrix out. So at some point, you really have to, 
you really have to fill your matrix. So the sparseness is really something of your initial representation, but even in the, in the computational basis, like eigenfunctions are not sparse in, in some sensible way. Hmm? Okay, good then, see you tomorrow.